Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Friday the 11th of March. Uh, I'm trying to think back to Friday the 11th of February. Were we living in a different world? I think we must have been. So episode 69, that bit's common. That keeps on ticking up anyway. Uh, today is a very special one. It's what I'm calling a Ukraine special. And um, that's such a massive topic that clearly we couldn't begin to cover all of it. So there's really three areas that I thought we would be looking at after an initial briefing from uh, James Chaplin, who is much closer to these things than we are based in Warsaw. Um, we're gonna be looking at cyber um, with um, Tim from the NCC. What, what, what's all that about? Is it just, is it technology? Is it people? Is it process? Or is it perhaps some mix of the three? We're gonna be looking at reputation. Um, and this is really, is ESG now gonna become a reality for many firms? Lots of people have perhaps paid lip service to elements of the ESG agenda. Maybe now they actually have to, uh, stand up and uh, be counted and recognize that may cause them some financial and possibly other damage. And then lastly, what, what does that mean in terms of the board, the strategy? What are the priorities? What are the things that actually people will need to now be thinking about? So um, just say hello to you for today. I'm Richard Chaplin. As you probably know, I'm the, uh, the founder and chief executive of the Managing Partners Forum. It's my great pleasure to be your host for today. Um, I first of all now likely to introduce you to today's panel and um, we've got uh, five people and myself included and firstly I'd like to introduce you to James Chaplin who is the founder and chief executive officer of VacancySoft and uh, he is basically going to be looking at some well he, I think it's three but it may have changed some of the plausible outcomes based on his influential blogs and if you haven't seen them the link is in the invitation that you were sent earlier today and a few days ago. Our second presenter, our second panelist, is Tim Rawlins. Tim is the Director and Senior Advisor at NCC Group. And he's really gonna be focusing on how can leadership teams, which is obviously today's audience, how can you enhance your firm's cyber resilience um, with a wealth of experience, not just at NCC, but also working in the, uh, the risk arena for many, many, many years, doing some quite dangerous things, I suspect, at times as well. Uh, our third <coughs> panel member is John Rowland. And John is the managing director of Cicero AMO, which as many of you will know, is the UK's top political consultancy. I'm allowed to say that, he probably isn't. No, I think it's true anyway. Some people accept that. I'm, con I'm and contractually obliged to say that it's the uh, UK's uh, leading consultancy. Well, there you go, he said it. I didn't. Anyway, he's looking at what are the, some of the reputational issues now that there's a lot of pressure in society, I always think um, when you have a, a situation like this, the, uh, suddenly everybody stops thinking about me, I, an individual, and suddenly it's the societal pressure starts building. Now, whether that happens in Russia or not, James, I'm sure, will be sharing with us, because I think there are some different issues there. But certainly in the UK and other European countries, very much the societal pressure has taken over. And that's then forcing participants, particularly organisations, he's mostly FTSE 100, but very much relevant to the larger excuse me, professional firms and throughout the sector as a professional firm themselves, to be true to their values, despite the costs. And our final uh, panel member today, and many of you on the call will probably know Simon. Uh, Simon uh, had a marketing background way back when he and I first met, which was about 30 plus years ago. Um, and he is currently, has a very interesting, Eminos Gries, I think is probably a really good way of putting it. He's the chairman, non-exec director and a board advisor to a number of professional firms and, and he's asked, I've asked him to talk a bit about what does this mean in terms of priorities? How few of those firms I suspect had playbooks for this particular scenario? Uh, well, the politicians certainly didn't. So I suspect most professional firms didn't either. So how are they coping in particular, because London and grad stretches way beyond London, you know, are the, the, the mid-sized firms, the ones who are providing personal services to directors who may have a Russian background, but may or may not be linked to the Russian state. So not trying to, I think that's going to be really interesting. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about forum news before I go on with uh, the poll. So hundreds of people are watching the videos from the past shows. Don't miss out. We've got a great audience today, um, well, well into good numbers. So please do watch the videos. The ones from today will all be up there sometime next week. Uh, if you haven't yet signed up for Mentor Match, it's a free program. And what we're doing there is bringing together mentors and mentees and giving them a secure, confidential place for both parties to engage in and track all aspects of the mentor and relationship. We've already got three mentorships in progress. We've got 130 people who signed up for mentors, about 100 mentees. 
and they're as far away as New Zealand, quite frankly. So it's definitely got it's it's writing a thing. And I think in the current climate where people actually really do find the need to unburden occasionally, having somebody who can help you um, is particularly if they work for a different organisation, which is the key facet. So and it's never too late to apply because it's a continuous program. We're matching every day. And lastly, and I think this one I may have mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we're doing a summit on innovation. And if anybody's familiar with esports, which is kind of where you're watching gamers, we're going to do something quite similar, a mock board design sprint uh, run moderated by Tim Borley, who's top prof, and uh, using Miro templates so that we can actually watch the moves, a bit like a chess contest, I guess, as well as hear the dialogue. That's on the 18th of May in London, and we'll be sending out invitations to from managing partners and directors of innovation primarily for, for, from leading firms. So think about esports because we haven't done that before, but I think that's quite an interesting development. So what are we doing now? Well, let's just move on. First of all, a little bit of feedback from UK government. Um, we always try and do a poll and you may have seen um, today's poll is actually going to be on cybersecurity. But before we do that, let's just talk about what last week, a couple of weeks ago, polls suggested. We looked at leadership attributes. If you weren't on the, the show, I'll just quietly take you through the headlines. Um, and this won't surprise most people, I suspect, but most, most of the people who responded felt that their firm was ahead of the sector. We're doing things and measuring things and doing things differently. And our clients and uh, people at the firm recognize the changes. Um, well, I think we all kind of know that there's a wonderful saying, I think, where they say that people who are involved in serious material road traffic accidents still believe they're good drivers. Whoops. Uh, we're in the top quartile anyway. Uh, so 80 percent believe that sector firms do not look sufficiently to other sectors for ideas and insight. Haven't we heard that one before? But that's an honest assessment from within. And one of the options I gave them there was that there's nothing worth hearing, nothing worth listening to in other sectors. And then nobody ticked that. So recognition that we could do more to look for other areas. And at the moment with Ukraine, everybody's looking for ideas and insights from other places. So this kind of reinforces that, I think. And then in terms of the leadership traits, um, things that people thought we were um, best at uh, was giving other people time and taking personal responsibility. The things they felt they were less good at uh, was to courage, the courage to innovate and take risks. And, and hey, we're talking about risk today, so let's let's move on from there. But uh, so, what are we going to do today in today's poll? Well, what do we took? Well, first of all, a couple of charts. Do you believe that professional services firms are measuring things differently compared with two years ago? And the red one is what they think the sector's doing, and the blue one is what they think they're doing. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's quite a big at the top, a lot more blue than red, in other words, which is measuring and doing differently. And then the other one I'll show you quickly is firms do not look sufficiently into other sectors for ideas and insight. And uh, that again is 80% in red saying we think that's the case. So there you go on that one. Okay, let's do today's anonymous poll. Um, what I wanted to talk about is cyber resilience, um, pretty key topic, I think. The volume of non-trivial cyber attacks on your firm. Have you any ideas? The, ex the level of investment you're making in cybersecurity, the extent to which it's viewed as a board issue. Are you managing threats? To what, are you agree to what extent are you planning for ransomware and other horrible things? Uh, are you measuring cyber risk indicators? Uh, are you rewarding people who, do the, who, who, who stop it happening, who aren't in the cyber team? And are you sanctioning, possibly most interesting, the partners and others who maybe facilitate the cyber attack through their behaviours? And so we didn't have as big, and usually we get a bit more than 32% of you participating. I suspect it's because it's a topic that um, you may not be as familiar with as you might wish to be. So we'll see about that. And Tim, I'm sure we'll have views on that one. So let's go through the first question, which you recall was how often is your firm subject to, to non-trivial attacks? And 58% of you said that was they were unsure. Uh, I think Kim will correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was around about 50% for the last time we ran this as well. So not much change there. Um, to what extent has the volume of non-trivial cyber attacks on your firm altered over the past three years? Again, about a third were unsure. I think that number's a bit less than it was uh, back in June when we Ross rang this poll. But um, <clears throat> a few people thought it had more than tripled. Um, the majority thought it had increased, but not as much as doubled. Um, whether that's statistically the case, who knows, but there we go. Uh, what's your firm's current level of investment in cybersecurity? Um, a little bit of a range there. 25% um, of you aren't sure. Um, about a quarter think it's less than 1%. 
and a small percentage think it's over five and the rest are all scattered. So I think there's no particular clarity on that question. Uh, where do you think the level of investment will be? Well, it's a little bit higher, but again, if some of you aren't sure, some of you saying over 5%, but the biggest people are plumping from one to 2% in terms of future expenditure on cybersecurity. Uh, number six, to what extent is cyber risk viewed as a board issue? Um, <clears throat> we've got a few, uh, 8%, who say that is not seen as a board issue at all, a bit worrying. Um, there's 40 odd percent, which is the biggest chunk saying the board is kept informed uh, of risks on a regular basis. Um, about a quarter say that the board has gone that step further and actually articulated its cyber risk appetite and is tracking the compliance. Um, the next set that was more or less nobody saying um, actively managing it and ensure it informs our strategy and vice versa. And the final one is saying that people view cyber as an integral part of innovation and growth. It's led from the top, discussed at every board meeting with everyone at the firm expects to contribute to cybersecurity, which Tim will probably tell us is a nirvana, but again, less than 10% think that's true at their firm. Uh, so which ones are actively managed? The ones that came, came through strongest there are phishing and malware. Um, there are some other ones like eavesdropping, man in the middle, uh, which is getting quite low numbers, unpatched vulnerabilities. Again, a quarter of you aren't sure. Um, which are in the ransomware attack recovery plan. Um, not that many people are thinking about whether deciding whether to pay the ransom or not. <clears throat> um, a few are thinking about are you being people who are being adversely impacted? Only a third of people are doing that. So the others are staying in ignorance, presumably. Um, the insurance one is a little bit higher. That's probably the one that's highest, but I suspect it's a little bit up to the date. Obviously, restoring the infrastructure, that's kind of a given or the thing falls over. Um, a, a third, about a third are informing the regulators. Um, that, again, I think is quite a good, sensible thing to do. Only about a third are coordinating the response. A few are thinking about preventing further attacks. And a couple said we don't have a ransomware attack recovery plan at all. And nearer 40 percent aren't sure on that one. Um, does have other, <clears throat> what about the cyber risk indicators? I know this is a bit technical. appreciate that. But <clears throat> there really aren't any that come looking down the list. None of them are hitting more than about a third, uh, and they would include things like um, lack of prioritization, uh, cyber cultural resistance towards cybersecurity, inadequate assessments of cyber risk, lack of comms emerging, lack of people with the right expertise to manage the program, lack of technical expertise. All of them have got, unfortunately, have those indicators in play. So again, work there. To what extent are people public rewards given to people from the non from a non-specialist role for helping prevent a cyber attack never is 75 percent 25 percent sometimes and in terms of the person an individual who actually <clears throat> whose conduct facilitated a cyber attack 67 percent never 25 percent sometimes only eight percent consistently so again uh, i always say in life that you know if people are perceived to get away with it then it's more likely to happen again um so uh, that could be a comment about Russia, I suspect, as well. Um, but anyway, I will stop sharing now, and I will invite our first guest, which I said is James Chaplin. And um, James is the founder and chief executive officer of Vacancy Soft, which is a data analytics company based in Warsaw with a very strong, extensive network of relationships in the, uh, not just into Warsaw, but has an office in Lviv, et cetera, in Ukraine. And he's talking about some of the plausible outcomes based on his influential blogs. Over to you, sir. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, this is going to be a bit of a whistle stop. I'm just going to run through some key scenarios, which I think are probably the most likely outcomes that we'll see. Uh, before I do that, this is quite a shocking statement to make people in the West, but um, Putin's actually achieving his objectives. If you look at before this war started and he wants to deconstruct, was he trying to achieve this in this war? First of all, he wanted to take Kherson. Kherson is the uh, oblast just north of Crimea. The reason he wants to take that is because after the 2014 conflict, the Ukrainians built a dam which stopped fresh water going through to Crimea. So what you saw happen was in the first days of the war, that dam was destroyed. And with that, the Russians were able to uh, get water flowing right the way through to Crimea again. And that's what they're working on at the moment. That was their first objective, done. Their second objective is to secure the Sea of Azov. 
uh, which is the closed sea, uh, which is east of uh, Crimea. Uh, and that means taking all the key cities from Mariupol, Melitopol, all of those, uh, basically done. I mean, pretty much done, let's be honest. So objective two is done. Uh, then he wanted to take the eastern borders, that's Luhansk, Donetsk, Kharkiv, flattening them. You know, they, they can't hold out much longer, let's be honest. They are going down. There's uh, uh, And especially now that Kherson is taken, that's one of the key resupply lines through to the east of Ukraine taken as well. It's very, very difficult now for the Ukrainian army to resupply on the eastern side. Um, the next one is then Odessa. And that means then he get, uh, the Russians get total control of the coastline. Well, guess what? If you look at the news at the moment, they're now bombarding Odessa. And then finally, there's Kiev. And once you take Kiev, it's basically game over anyway. So if you say those are five objectives, three are basically done and the remaining two are in progress. Um, so the, the next thing to think about is that um, Putin is, you know, not somebody who is a Democrat and he's not somebody who's a capitalist. So the way that he views the world is fundamentally different to anybody or anything that we how we think. So for him, he will take all the hits, all the sanctions, all the, the blockades, this, that and the other. He doesn't care because what he thinks about is land and resources. Now, what people may not recognize, realize is that Ukraine in terms of resources is so rich. I mean, for example, the Ukraine has almost as much natural gas as Norway. For example, um, it has so many resources, like it's one of the top countries in the world in lithium, which is for batteries, etc. So um, it's a resource monster. So if Russia takes the Ukraine, it becomes such a resource monster that they can literally blow raspberries at the West and say, well, we're going to do business with someone because let's not forget the Chinese and the Indians are both resource poor nations and they will be buyers. So let's understand. He's looking at it saying, well, the West, whatever, we'll just do business with people who want to do business with us. And if we take a hit in the short term, so be it. So he's also got complete control of the domestic narrative. So when you're looking at it, he remains very popular. Uh, about 70 percent of people in, uh, in Russia only consume state media. Um, the minority who are against him are either being locked up or they're leaving. And for other, and of the people who are there, there's actually like a general indignation. It's kind of like, why is the West being so annoying? don't they understand we're Russia and what they don't want to sell to us okay fine and believe it or not that's that's generally the consensus that's made it's crazy I know but that's actually how people are thinking that so the first thing I'll say is with that once we understand these base assumptions there's no chance Putin's being deposed people like in the West to talk about it but it's a fight of fancy uh it's not happening so let's talk about plausible scenarios OK, I think, OK, the first plausible scenario I want to talk about is what I'm going to call Fortress Russia. Fortress Russia is he looks for a quick win. Now, horrible as it is to say, if we take the 1945 Japanese case study, when the Russians, when the Americans knew that to invade Japan would take years and would take immense resources. And what they did is they just nuked cities to force surrender. We're now entering a mode where Putin may just decide, because they're one of the leading countries in the world in tactical nukes, that the way to actually enforce a quick surrender is to nuke Lviv. Now, why Lviv? Well, it's on the border. It's not really a Russian city. And it makes the whole area radioactive. And it means that you completely end resupply supply lines through and you turn around to Kiev and you say you're on your own now guys you've got no resupply lines running your all your military infrastructure and leadership in the west is gone do you want to surrender now now if, if they do that yes they are pariahs but we've already established he doesn't care about that so you know what you see happen is a very very quick end to the war uh, you see an iron curtain fall down yes economic sanctions are maxed yes um you know it's, there's going to be a resistance but they've already started rounding up and locking people up in Kherson and moving them to russian prisons which people haven't really been following um so that that that's the first plausible scenario i talk about um, the second one I talk about is a frozen conflict. Now, this is when he doesn't do nuclear weapons. Um, in this one, I think you just see like a, a it's like 2014 to 22 all over again. It just drags on. The Russians have made increased territorial gains. They're not necessarily looking to take more land because it's really difficult to win more. But the Ukrainians don't have the force and power to take land back. Um, so you just see this all just dragging on and on and on uh, because the terms of any kind of settlement are unacceptable to the Ukrainians. Um, 
Then there's a third one, which is a negotiated settlement. Now, this is uh, a negotiated settlement. Now, the Russians have put out their terms. So for people who aren't following, well, they've said, we want the Ukrainians to basically renounce any NATO membership, renounce the path of the EU, a, start, a Finlandization. So basically, we will be a neutral state and um, to have Russian as the second language. I think that there is a chance that, um, I mean, there's three rounds of talks now. And what's interesting is that with each round of talks, the Russians are becoming more reasonable in their demands, if I say that. Um, so there is a chance that as we move through to the next rounds of talks and the Russians realize that the cost of a frozen conflict is just gonna be very, very high. Um, that they dilute certain aspects to make them more palatable and we move towards negotiated settlement. Um, it's not a completely painless war for the Russians and they, they, if they have a negotiated settlement which they can agree with the Ukrainians, they can then use that as leverage to actually see sanctions come down. Um, so yeah, so from the top, like I said, my, my top three scenarios that I see are uh, fortress Russia with a nuclear strike, a uh, frozen conflict where this drags on for years to come, or a negotiated settlement where you see a Finlandization of the Ukraine and you see them renounce um, a move to be to move to the West. Um, anyway, thanks for listening. As, as Richard mentioned, I, I do write about this on my blog, so uh, you know I think you can uh, guys have access to that if you want to get a deep, a deep dive on any of these things. Typical piece about two thousand words long, so I try and go into lots of detail on each of these points. Thanks a lot again. Now I will invite our second presenter, which is Tim Rawlins, and Tim is the director and senior advisor at NCC Group. And he's going to be talking about how leadership teams can enhance their firm's cyber resilience, particularly pertinent in the current climate. Over to you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Um, cyber resilience is, is an interesting concept. What I would say is really what underpins this is actually it's your business resilience. And the shorthand of that is your ability to deliver a business service. So to be frank, given that most organizations now rely so heavily on the constant and active engagement of their IT systems. Um, it's very hard to imagine a state where the organization, your organizations could really exist without its IT. But what we need you to do is to is really focus your attention. Now, having seen those, pool, those polls, there seems to be an awful lot of A, unsure, uh, and B, you know, very poor or very low levels of focus on IT. And with that IT, the cybersecurity. We would typically expect organizations to be spending between eight and 12% of their IT budget on cybersecurity, uh, which is an interesting number. And, and it varies quite considerably style, size, complexity of the organization, but also where you draw the boundaries of uh, cybersecurity. As Richard was kind enough to mention earlier, we see cybersecurity very much as a people process and technology concept. And you've really got to drive out of your mind the fact that cybersecurity is an IT problem with an IT solution. This really is a whole firm problem. And looking again at some of those questions and the results, this idea of, you know, do you hold people to account? Do you punish people for letting people in? Um, I would suggest is, is actually the wrong way around. When I was chief security officer of a very large, very dull Swiss bank, we had a clear desk policy. And the concept there was you didn't go around and put a big note on the desk of somebody who had left something out. Actually, you went around and put a chocolate on the desk of the people wrapped, of course, for health and safety reasons, but you left a chocolate on the desk of the people who'd done the right thing. And that whole concept of doing the right thing is one element that does underpin good cybersecurity. So in the conversations with your IT team, in conversations with your chief information officer, ask them, what are they doing to make it easy for your people to do the right thing? People often go, oh, well, if you know, we send them phishing, um, uh, we send them phishing emails, and if they click on it, that then they get told off or they get punished. Um, to be honest, the research suggests that that isn't the way forward. Yes, you might want to give them additional training and advice, but actually, a no blame culture is a better way of engaging with people encouraging people to do the right thing, supporting them to do the right thing and making it easy to do the right thing. So if your people need to share data, 
ask your IT team to set up a secure way of doing it. So the, the board and your executive need to be providing focus. I was horrified to see you know, somebody replying to that poll where they said they considered cybersecurity not to be a board issue. I think you are a significant outlier. And to be honest, if you end up on, at the receiving end of a cyber breach, the ICO and other investigators are going to take a very, very dim view if it, cybersecurity hasn't been a board level consideration. Uh, we've just seen Tucker's find 98,000 uh, pounds by the ICO, one of the first ICO fines post GDPR um, for their failure to introduce basic levels of cybersecurity. And to be honest, they've had a, a reputational hit on that. Uh, <clears throat> they certainly, it's now led them to have to spend an awful lot more money on securing their estate. So my, my suggestion to you would be, let's not wait until post event. Build your resilience now, train, test, uh, support your people so that they know what they've got to do. And that means all the way up to board level, gold team crisis management exercises, where you look to ensure that your top team, your senior leadership team are well prepared, that they've developed the muscle memory such that they know what they're going to do. And we see time and time again, organizations that have planned and prepared come out of a cyber incident far, far better. And please don't be like one client I ended up dealing with uh, just two weeks ago, where CEO hand, you know, head in hands going, why us? Why were we attacked? We're just a small company. We don't have any secrets. And by the time I talked him through the information that he did hold and the value that that would be to the criminal, the financially motivated criminals, he, you could see the lights coming on. But that's too late. He's already suffered. You need to build in that resilience, that ability to deliver business service by focusing on your detection and response capabilities. If they really want to, the bad guys and girls are going to get into your system. But if you can detect them and respond to that in, in as quickly and as efficient manner as possible with good backups, with good preparation, then you will lead yourself uh, in a much, much better place. You will have identified which business services you need to get back up and running uh, most quickly. You will have developed that stakeholder mapping so you know who you're going to be talking to. And don't forget, as senior leaders yourself, you are going to be picking up the phone to your stakeholders, to ask them for support, to ask them for time whilst you resolve the problem and convincing them that you will continue to deliver that business service to them. But that's gonna be something you need to be ready to do. You need to be prepared for it and have that understanding of what's happening, what your plan is, what your strategy is and where you're going. And all of this is gonna be underpinned by an enormous level of ambiguity because you're not going to know the details and the facts, but you're still gonna to have to set a strategy and take decisions. And you're not gonna know because any investigation will take time. And it's going to take time for you to bring the right people together. You're going to need external resources. The chances of you being able to deal with this on your own are very, very slim. You're gonna need those people in the room, virtually, presumably at the moment, um, but you're gonna need that support. So your people need to be ready, you need to be ready uh, in order to drive resilience across the organization. Don't leave it. Do it now. It's not too late. We haven't seen very high levels of cyber attacks coming out of the Ukraine situation. Um, we think that, I mean, they certainly have been very heavily focused on Ukrainian, Belarusian, Russian organizations. And companies with links into those countries are going to probably see the wash off of cyber attacks that are happening locally into their systems. But we haven't seen that mass targeting of, of uh, Western organizations that many people expected. So you've still got time, get yourself in the right place and become more resilient. Thank you, Richard. Oh, thanks very much, Tim. And uh, I think we'll all watch that video several times. There's so many wise words in it. So thank you very much indeed, appreciate it. Um, now we're moving on to our third guest, um, John Rowlands has been on the show before, um, and he's, I mentioned, the Managing Director of CISA AMO. 
And he's looking, we picked up the word reputation and crisis management, and this is very much the crossover, I think, between uh, Tim's world and John's world, is that actually experts need to come in and help sort out these sort of issues, particularly when societal pressure, as I mentioned, is forcing firms to be true to their ESG values. So over to you, John. Uh, thanks, Richard. And um, thank you to Tim and particularly to James for a, a very sobering corrective to some of the information flow that we're receiving here in the West, which is, um, you know, I think is shaped by a particular perspective. Um, I, I'm going to reflect on this question of reputation, both as a practitioner and a provider of professional services, and also uh, on the basis of some of the conversations I've had with my clients, who, as Richard said earlier on, tend to be on the, on the larger side, but to 100 uh, scale companies, often in financial services. So they've been right, right, right in the thick of this. Um, my first observation is that um, Ukraine is a watershed moment in corporate reputation management and is a very important moment in the evolution of ESG. Now, ESG has uh, climbed up the agenda big time over the last few years, um, partly pushed by climate, but also um, now increasingly by other, other social factors. Um, and it's very important for industries like ours, professional services, because many of us have or uh, have had connections to Russia in some way or another, either we've got affiliates in Russia or we've built businesses in Russia or we have clients who are Russian. And so that's causing a lot of soul search searching in particular sectors. Um, and why I think this is a watershed is because the West is not actually at war militarily with Russia, but it is certainly at war economically with Russia. And um, business is a battalion in that war, but it doesn't appear to me like it's been conscripted. A lot of businesses have gone right to the recruitment office and signed up uh, and, 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 and actually preempted government action by removing or divesting their interests in Russia. I don't think I have ever seen, in fact, I haven't seen anything of this scale happen so quickly in, in, in my career, which is 15 years, so it's not exactly an epoch, but it, it is a reasonably long time. And business has signed up for this war for, for, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because sanctions have just made business extremely difficult to do in Russia. I've got uh, friends and colleagues who have, for example, just can't pay their people in Russia anymore. They can't transact business. So it's really hard to do. It's so hard that it's not viable anymore. But the second reason why this has happened is, is, is because of reputation. It's because of societal pressure. And what's happened, which I think is quite fascinating in this case, is that businesses have actually been ahead of public opinion often and not behind it. Uh, and before we came on, I was talking to, to the panel about uh, why I think BP is an extraordinarily interesting example of this. It's had a lot you know, long standing interests in Russia, but it's just decided, decided very early on that it was going to sell uh, off its Russian business, whatever the cost, even if that meant a write down of billions and billions of pounds. Uh, it had obviously judged that the uh, it was untenable to continue with that business and it would rather take the hit of billions of pounds than try to justify, uh, justify ongoing um, activity in Russia and to try and negotiate the, the sanctions. But, you know, oil and energy, that's right at the heart of this crisis. But where does Big Macs fit into this? And I think this is where this is very interesting. We're not just talking about people who are connected to the, the Putin regime or people that are doing business with oligarchs. This is about fast food for ordinary muscle bites. And the, the, there, there is no longer any shades of gray in this discussion. It is simply business with Russia is bad. And if you're doing the right thing, uh, then, then you have to with, withdraw from Russia and cut your ties. And I'm gonna come back to that point in a moment. So these businesses have moved quickly to make these decisions. Um, uh, it hasn't been costless. I think what, what has happened here is that relationships, some of which are, many of which are totally legitimate, that have been built over years, um, have been cut off. And the thing here is there's no real playbook for this. Nobody really knows exactly what they're doing. They're taking the decision on the basis of a moral judgment. But the unwinding of this 
is an extremely challenging thing to do. But again, this underlines how important and how valuable reputation in, is in this modern world. That arguably 20 or 25 years ago, some of these businesses might have taken the decision to just ride it out and see what happens rather than just to cut uh, cut investment, cut ties uh, and, 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 and remove their business from Russia. So I think from a reputational perspective, people have moved, businesses have moved very fast, but I think we'll have to reflect carefully on what's just happened in, in the future. Um, and, and I think that's crucial because many of my clients have been really focused on the E part of ESG over the last few years. COP26 uh, moved a lot of businesses towards race to zero and developing science-based targets. And that was a bit, that's a big business challenge for a lot of firms. Uh, a lot of my clients aren't in professional services. They have real assets, you know, whether they run hotels or they run defense businesses. So they've been, they, they've been dealing with this question, but even though that's challenging, at least it's science-based. What we're talking about here is something much more political, much more of a cultural construct, and is therefore much more difficult to quantify and to plan for. So how do you build an ESG strategy, a rational strategy, that can take account of what's just happened? Um, so for example, you might decide, well, Ukraine is a case in which we will decide that we're going to cut ties with Russia. But might you, under what circumstances might you cut ties with a Gulf state, for example, because of some war that they're prosecuting over there. So what does it mean to, 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 to make this decision? And I think we've got a, what appears to be a relatively clear cut case here, but can it be generalized? Um, how does this affect wider decision making for multinational companies that have got businesses interests all over the world? And I think where, where again, I think we need to reflect on this is that when businesses went into Russia in the 90s and the early 2000s, they thought they were doing God's work to some degree, that they were part of a, an investment story, a democratization story, a story of helping embed liberal capitalism to build a Russian middle class. And that has all unwound. And maybe that's been a process that's been happening over some time. But it's also, I guess, a uh, an important uh, thing to consider that you have to constantly reevaluate reputational risks over time and how they're changing. And sometimes that can mean some pretty uncomfortable decisions. So um, just in terms of advice, um, to the extent that you can, I think from a reputational perspective in the West, taking new business in Russia is now untenable. Um, investment is off the table anyway because of sanctions to a large degree. But I think what you have to do is look extremely carefully at your relationships and affiliates, maybe not just in Russia, but in other parts of the world and stress test what you might do. What is your playbook if a crisis unfolds in another part of the world? And why is it that you might be able to justify taking action in Russia to this degree, but you might not take it in, in other places? And I think that's the longer term question is how do we consistently apply a business framework for making very tough decisions like this. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Uh, it's interesting how the right things come through both Tim's conversation and John's now. So Simon, uh, Simon Slater is the chair, is a chairman, non-exec director and board advisor, Eminos Grease, I think I would probably call him. And he works with a number of particularly mid-sized law firms, not exclusively, having worked in some of the very large ones himself. And what, what's actually happening? Are, are they watching or are they actually doing something about it? Over to you, sir. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, in the interests of uh, the clock, I'm going to be as brief as possible to allow for uh, questions um, uh, at the end. Um, coming last in this series of um, speakers, you won't be surprised that um, there'll be some duplication in what I'm about to say. And I promise you that we have no collaboration over this uh, prior, prior to this event. So um, it's very interesting that what I'm about to say rather reinforces what's gone before. Um, what are the revised priorities for leadership teams? Um, well, I think there are four of them. And um, number one, um, without, without doubt, is people. And even before this crisis, people was top of law firms agenda anyway, purely from a retention, remuneration and recruitment 
perspective, but it's number one now for a rather different reason. Um, the people employed by organizations, in this case, professional service firms, are watching very carefully the response of their firms to uh, what's going on in Ukraine. Um, if they're large firms, how decisively have, made, have they made the decision to withdraw? Um, what decisions have they made here in the UK to cease acting for um, Russian clients um, that are closely um, aligned with um, the Russian state? Um, and, um, and thirdly, they're watching their firms, particularly the larger firms, but not exclusively the, just the largest firms, in terms of any help they're able to provide um, to the Ukraine crisis, be it pro bono advice, um, uh, raising money and, and donations and providing aid. So I think, you know, tens of thousands of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people are employed by professional service firms in, just in this country alone. Um, and they're watching very closely what their firm's response to this is. So that's number one. Number two, um, I would define as really ethics and ESG. Um, I, I won't say too much about this because previous speakers have really touched on this, but, and I absolutely agree with um, the, the, uh, the speaker before me um, when he said that um, this, this really is the issue which forces organizations to have, um, to take a holistic approach to proper, ESG policies that extend well beyond this one uh, tragic event in, in the Ukraine. Um, but, you know, that's linked with the first point about people. People are increasingly selective about the organizations they're prepared to, prepared to work with and for. Um, and, you know, ethics and ESG and all of the, that, that entails is very much part of that. The third one is uh, security, uh, really. Um, I was as shocked as the, uh, our speaker on cyber that um, uh, some people uh, declared that cyber security was not a board uh, agenda item. It absolutely is. This whole issue of security, risk and compliance um, it is very much um, one of these four um, priorities. Um, from a on client onboarding perspective, AML processes, due diligence, um, particularly with regard to politically exposed persons, um, cybersecurity, of course, but also day, you know, business as usual systems resilience. Um, these are absolutely um, you know, top of the mind as far as the, the boards that I'm working with are concerned. And finally, uh, the financial consequences of the decisions that are being made, particularly by the large organizations that are having to withdraw from, uh, from Russia or to um, shore up their presence in Ukraine. Um, what are the financial and operational consequences of those decisions? Um, you know, the costs associated with them will not be insignificant. Um, and it's perhaps, perhaps inappropriate to mention this now, but further down the line, how will they replace that income um, that is derived from, say, Russia? Um, so those four things really are the, the, the priorities that I am seeing. And, and really, in a word, they all add up to reputation, as our previous speaker said. And one of the hats that I wear is that I am chair of a, of a legal uh, PR consultancy, um, and I can tell you that the phones have been pretty hot in the last couple of weeks from all sorts of um, uh, law firms in particular um, seeking advice on all of this. Um, and uh, I know that we're not alone in that regard. Um, so there we are. I said I'd be as brief as I, I could be. Um, back to you, Richard. Uh, thanks very much. And we've got uh, we've got about eight minutes left, so we'll uh, try and uh, cover a few interesting points. I mean, uh, perhaps, uh, James, just sort of uh, now that you've kind of heard the, the more Western perspectives, is that do you think that how, how do you think the two worldviews that you're that you were talking about interact or do you think just the Iron Curtain will appear again? 
Uh, I, mean, look, I think the big question is, um, I mean, look, if you guys follow the media, what you'll see is that Zelensky's now coming out and saying he's open to a deal with Russia and the Russian conditions are becoming more uh, palatable. So I think the big question is, um, what ha um, if they do a deal, what? how does the West respond? Uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of pressure by German companies, uh, a lot of pressure from French companies to re-engage with Russia in that instance. And especially if there's been a deal between UK and Ru uh, Ukraine and Russia, there'll be a lot of people who then say, well, they've done a deal. We did our job to force Putin to the table. He came to the table. So let's go back to business as normal. I I'm not saying everyone's going to respond like that, but I do think there'll be a significant number of businesses that do respond like that. You're on mute. Um, John, just sort of picking up that point about reputation, which Simon obviously raised as his fourth area, and James is now saying, well, actually, it's going to be business as usual if there's some sort yeah, of deal he, is concocted. Actually, it's something I could have covered in my rights. It's, it's an extremely good point. There will be an aftermath at some point, rather, and there'll be a decision about whether companies want to go back in. I think there is a part of this question which is, important which is what Putin does with the assets that have been left behind so for example uh, he's talking about potentially nationalizing thing, them and being and then being put in the control of the Russian state if that's the, if that is the case then Russia is sort of uninvestable uninvestable isn't it because you don't know if you put your money in whether you're ever going to get it back out again but if there is a accommodation with Western business there is there is a chance of that consumer brands will struggle heavily with this uh, because um, even if there's a peace deal, I think the indignation from certain campaign groups and consumer groups will be such that it will be it will be difficult to go back to business as usual for a little while. But you know, it's, it's a good point. It's a good point. I think we've got the situation with the Americans where they impose sanctions. It takes them a very long time to wind sanctions back down. Yeah. Uh, as we saw with Indonesia, you know, even sort of 10 years after it had completely changed its political stance, uh, there were still sanctions in place. So the American firms are going to really struggle. I think that there's also, I think it's revealed some home truths about just how far Kremlin control goes into the business community. And I think most people if they knew it, didn't want to know about it. And now that truth is, is right there in broad daylight. I'm just just quickly, I mean, the Danone CEO came out and said yesterday that as far as they're concerned, they feel that they have a duty to continue supplying stock goods to Russians. Um, and um, like I said, I, I do think there's a fundamental difference between European countries and uh, companies in terms of how they approach this and American companies. Um, the European economies are so integrated into Russia that I, I genuinely think that if there is a deal, they are going to be lobbying so hard uh, to be allowed to do business again. They even uh, that they're, they're just going to, you know, they're going to do whatever they can to get back in. I genuinely believe that. Okay, let's just pick up another point. Uh, I've come back to Tim, if I may, for a minute, and <clears throat> making it very clear that <clears throat> okay, some some businesses don't see it as a board issue, but hopefully that's a serious minority. But even if they do recognise that it's a board issue and they don't feel they've done enough, where do they start? Where do you actually start putting together this playbook, this uh, cyber resilience that is may or may not be as, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, immediately pressing as possibly some people think, but is absolutely there out there at the moment? I think um, let's, let's just get the basics done. If you look at the uh, ICO's criticism of, you know, of Tucker's, um, they had not, introduced multi-factor authentication. They did not have adequate control of their assets. They didn't understand what they'd got. I think there's a lot of challenges that, to be frank, uh, we should be well past in terms of cyber hygiene. Um, the Most of the firms I imagine listening to this will have started that process. Um, what I would suggest is you, you hurry it along. You give more investment to it in order to push it faster than you might have expected. We did a big piece of work with a major firm up in Edinburgh and discovered they had a four year plan for getting rid of some of their old systems. That's four years of carrying, to be effect, 
an unacceptable level of risk. So when, when we advise them, they refocus, they reprioritize, and they're moving that, that legacy system off their estate. So look at your legacy systems, try and pull that down. Look at you know, introducing multi-factor authentication, good backups, uh, and we mean by good offline, and re be, you know, be assured that you can rebuild from those backups. Um, so there are, there are some really good hygiene. Cases I've been involved with on a regular basis involve data that companies didn't know they had, data that they were holding that they should have got rid of. Um, and to be honest, again, you're just carrying additional risk. So give it some focus, bring it up as a board issue. It absolutely should be on a board table. It should be on your risk register and you should be looking to drive risk out of your estate. You can salami slice down those risks. You can do little things that will make a big difference. Um, so, you know, engage with your teams, not just HR, not just IT, whole firm and get that movement, that cultural change that you need to be more resilient. Simon, just perhaps I know we're in the last couple of minutes, but just quickly from you, I mean, to what extent do you see the firms that you're talking with actually addressing that issue at the board level? Um, well, the, the, the firms that, that, that I work with really are, um, you know, and um, reassuringly, it's been a, you know, not a standard uh, uh, agenda item for every board meeting, but certainly on a quarterly basis, um, you know, a, a, a pretty comprehensive report on cybersecurity and risk management um, uh, presented to, to the board and the difficult questions addressed. So um, um, I can only speak on behalf of the firms that, that I'm close to. Um, one interesting thing I do want to share with everybody, and I read this um, earlier this week, and I'm afraid I don't have the source for it, but it's quite interesting. Um, this is on ESG. It says that uh, while 70 of the top 100 global law firms claim to be advising, advising clients on ESG issues, only 17, one seven of them publish ESG reports themselves. Uh, so um, there's room for improvement in terms of practicing what we preach there. Uh, fantastic. Well, it's unfortunately um, that time of the day when I need to uh, sh show the full gallery, as they say, but more importantly, to thank our excellent speakers for their contribution today. So I'd like to thank um, James Chaplin, who gave us, uh, as somebody said, a little bit of a sobering analysis. Is it Fortress Wasser? Is it some of those other scenarios? Um, let's just bear in mind that what we, the way we think and the way that the Russian uh, state think are not always in alignment. Um, I'd like to thank Simon for his <clears throat> eminent degrees, his wise thoughts on what, what actually is going on. And again, the, as you say, if you're a PR firm, probably the phone hasn't stopped, I suspect, given people are very nervous about it. I'd like to thank John for kind of talking a bit about what does this actually mean in practice that maybe we're shifting from the E to the S and the G of, of ESG. Maybe it's just too big an area. Maybe we can just split it up again, who knows? But, but anyway, certainly that's, I think, been really helpful to people just to kind of drill down. And then <clears throat> I'd like to thank Tim for, let's go back to the basics. Let's help people do the right thing because at the end of the day, uh, if you just get the basics right, so there's an old saying, which is that when you're being chased by the saber-toothed tiger, it, 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 what really matters is that you run faster than the other person. So make yourself the person who is least interesting. Lock the doors rather than leaving them open, because all too often, sadly, it's the ones who are the easy targets who get done. Um, so there's some really, I think, nice practical stuff there. So I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, it's 10 o'clock, obviously. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time with a, another show. Uh, today's been a very special one in Ukraine. I don't think somehow, sadly, we won't be talking about Ukraine in two weeks' time, but who knows? Over to you. Bye for now.